so, we're really delighted to mark the launch of this important resource for health services staff across our entire system, which is anchored in our patient safety strategy. Over to you, Lorraine. You're most welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Maureen, for that introduction, and uh, I would like to echo that. I would like to welcome you all to QPS Talk Time and for the launch of the introduction to Human Factors for Healthcare Workers, written by Paul and Angela, um, who, who you'll hear more from in a minute. So, um, a brief introduction. My name is Lorraine. I am the Assistant National Director for Incident Management. And my team and I, we work collaboratively with some of our HSE colleagues, in particular QPS staff, frontline staff and patients to develop and implement policy and patient safety improvement strategies. Um, and as Maureen touched on, we are part of the National Quality Patient Safety Directorate that also incorporates education, intelligence, communication and quality improvement. Um, so I did only join very recently, having worked in the UK at various NHS trusts for the last 10 years, so I actually cannot take credit for this wonderful piece of work. Um, and I suppose I just want to give my colleagues full credit for their work um, that went into this. So uh, primarily, obviously, our authors, Paul O'Connor and Dr. Angelo D. And I would also like to acknowledge my team members who worked on this, which were Michael Carton, Fiona Culkin, Loretta Jenkins, Maggie McGarry, and then also from our QPS operational colleagues, um, Irene O'Hanlon, Maura Tuig, and Siobhan Masterson from the National Ambulance Service. Um, and they worked on this collectively and uh, uh, very uh, successfully. And um, I, uh, I can only commend them for their work. Um, it was initially commissioned by Patrick Lynch, and I, uh, I suppose then has moved over to the remit of Orla. Healy under the new restructure, corporate restructure. And the background to developing this resource was really, um, it stemmed from some of the work from the incident management framework um, that was developed in 2018. I think when that was initially launched, um, there was a commitment to reviewing uh, the framework as it was being implemented. And um, in line with our national patient safety strategy, engaging and empowering our staff and really seeking their feedback about how it was being implemented and that. And I think some of the feedback from that work and actually in reviewing the incident management framework was that there was a need for some additional resource and support in terms of human factors um, and how, how staff could apply this in their learning when they do carry out incident reviews and that, and which is probably why my team was particularly heavily involved in, in developing this with the, uh, with the authors. So the primary aim of the document is to provide staff with an understanding of the principles and applications of human factors and how it can be used to improve safety in healthcare. Um, I suppose human factors is integral to all our work in the health service, and you've touched on a few kind of headings already in terms of what it means to you. Um, but this guide has been written for everyone, so for all our colleagues um, and what I like about it, 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 it is very user friendly um, so I would very much encourage you all to kind of share it with your colleagues um, and consider how this applies to your own roles and how you can apply it locally. Um, and I suppose Paul will talk, Paul and Angela will give us a bit more detail in terms of what is covered within the guide. Um, so I will hand over to Paul now if that is Okay, and, and then we'd be happy to take questions afterwards as well. So, uh, thanks for inviting us to launch this guide with you and actually for giving Andrew and I the opportunity to write it. We're just, I'm going to give a little brief introduction to human factors, some thoughts around it. Then Angela will discuss the guide in a, in a bit more detail. So, next slide. So, this slide comes from uh, Amal, uh, Rene Amalberti, who's a, a patient safety researcher and, and, and doctor. And you can see that uh, if you look at some of these industries here, some of these high reliability industries like nuclear power and, and railway, they're, very, they're ultra safe. And so they manage, they manage their, their, their safety very well. They're actually, it's built in, into the system. And then obviously, if you look down at the other end, we have Himalayan mountaineering and professional fishing, which are far more dangerous uh, occupations. And I think from a, a research perspective, from a human factors perspective, healthcare is very interesting because it crosses all of these 
these domains it's from ultra safe to, to quite unsafe uh, so Angela and I, for example, spent a lot of time uh, looking at human factors in the nuclear industry. And I can assure you that one of the most boring places on earth is the uh, control room of a nuclear power station because, <laughs> because nothing happens there. But it's extremely dull having spent so much time looking at what they do because that is, is so well managed. Whereas if healthcare, there's bits of healthcare like that, like radiotherapy and blood transfusions, but there's also uh, some of the more risky end of healthcare, such as surgery or emergency ICU. So what that means, I guess, for healthcare workers like yourselves is it's a bit different from civil aviation or nuclear power, where you've actually got to consider lots of different risks, because depending on how you make decisions, how you manage risks varies considerably, depending on uh, what kind of healthcare you're involved in. And even if you're in a, one specific type of healthcare, even within, I guess, one procedure, the, the, the risk may change depending, depending on what's happening. So I think that's what makes healthcare probably interesting is what makes healthcare challenging and I think as a human factors researcher it also makes healthcare very 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 interesting compared to some sort of civil aviation where they've they've actually solved many of the problems whereas uh, healthcare is still is, is from a human factors perspective very interesting to, to, to study and learn go to the next slide so this is from Ken Catchpole who's uh, an English um, Human factors researcher now works in the states, and he he presented this at uh, at a, a conference last week. I don't know, I don't have a reference for this really yet. And he goes through these different kind of periods or epochs of of human factors. So the first one is is it's a systems problem. So all we need to do is we need better incident reporting. We need more rules. We need more procedures, and that's what we're going to do to solve our 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 patient safety kind of human factors issues. And I think we, he says, then we've moved on from that and we said, okay, that was the first thing. Now let's see what the other industries do. Let's look at civil aviation or nuclear power and let's, let's look at how they manage risk. And uh, so these are the, let's look at the low hanging fruit. The things are easy to fix. Let's try and standardize everything. Let's uh, impose all kinds of solutions to, uh, to our problems. Again, that doesn't really work. We can't standardize all of healthcare. That would make things a bit difficult. If you standardized emergency ICU, I don't actually think people will be able to do the job. So then we've moved on for that. Okay, so the easy wins weren't so, so easy. Let's implement a big load of solutions. Let's give everybody safety training. Let's give everybody safety checklists and then they, they have to use them. Again, there's kind of a recognition that maybe if I do these broad implementation of safety training, maybe what I've done is uh, it, doesn't really tr it doesn't speak to anyone. So for example, uh, maybe the human factors or the non-technical skills training you give to a surgeon is not gonna be the same as a non-technical skills training we give to someone that's working in community care. It, it doesn't make sense. So it, it's, it's hard to, to implement these cross industry because unlike civil aviation, actually I suppose that um, the healthcare industry is a collection of lots of different industries, lots of different ways of working. So it's hard to implement these broad solutions and for them to, to all work everywhere. And this is where Ken thinks we are now. So let's rethink what we're doing. So rules, technology, training, standardization, they're not going to solve all the problems in healthcare. We need to get back to thinking about people and recognizing that people are, our, are, are the strengths and that's how we can manage, manage the risks. So people are at the center of what we do. And that kind of brings us into human factors. And all of your, um, I looked at the chat there, all of your, your what human factors is to you, they're all true, I guess. And I guess that's the strength and possibly the weakness of human factors. So if you look at this def definition from the UK Health and Safety Executive, it's the environment that you work in, it's the organization and how they run things, it's the job that you're doing, it's the human, it's the team, it's the individual healthcare provider and how they interface with the patient who's also involved in that too. So human factors is it's in, it's an enormous thing because it's really taking a whole it's considering the whole system. So it's not just the individual providing the care. It's the team. It's the organization. It's even the uh, the social kind of environment that we're working in, even at a societal level. All of that impacts the care that we're delivering uh, to to our patients. So it's kind of it's all of your thing, all of the, the issues you brought up, and, and even maybe more. Go to the next slide. And because it's so big. It incorporates um, it, as a field, it's really a multidisciplinary field. So it incorporates all kinds of different disciplines. Um, so psychology like myself and Angela, but there's also engineers, biomechanics, occupational health, statisticians, uh, operations research management, 
even anthropometry, so how we, we kind of measure people and how they fit in the system. All of this is human factors, even though sometimes, you know, it's all different bits of human factors and maybe people think about it in slightly different ways. But I think the multidisciplinariness is a, is a strength and, guess a, and I guess a kind of a weakness. And maybe that's, that's some of the issues around how you kind of define human factors and, and what it is. Go to the next slide. If you think back to the history of human factors and where it came from, so really it has its roots in, in the US in World War II, because what they were trying to do is take a bunch of people off the streets who've never seen an airplane and then teach them to drive an airplane as fast as possible. And so there was a lot, a lot of work came out of that time in terms of around training and around design and the efficiency of training because we have to, or not because we, in, the, in World War II, they wanted to train people up as quickly as possible and get them out there fighting whoever it is that they needed to fight. And so because of that, they started to consider the design, in this case, of the aircraft and how it was designed. They wanted to make it as easy as possible so you could train people as quickly as possible to fly the airplanes. So they started to looking at cockpit design and trying to, desi to, uh, to design the cockpit in such a way that it fits and it's easy for the people to use. It's not a challenge for the people to use. So that's kind of the, the beginnings of human factors. And from that, it moved out into civil aviation, nuclear power after the Chernobyl disaster, oil industry out after the um, uh, Piper Alpha disaster. So all, it's funny, there has to be a big disaster, then suddenly people start thinking about this. So you need to have these, it seems that the first thing you need is a disaster, then people start thinking about it. And then actually what happens, because myself and Angela started to work in the oil industry, if there's not been a disaster for a while, then it kind of drops off. And then, it, and, then it, and then human factors comes back again after the um, deep water horizon mishap. Guess what? Human factors is, is back in vogue again in the oil industry. And then eventually it's around the design of automation. So in the late 1990s, it started to consider how human factors and automation work, work together. So that's kind of the history, a general history of human factors. We go to the next slide. Now, just focusing on human factors in healthcare, compared to some of those other industries, I suppose healthcare was kind of late, late to the game or late to the, the human factors story. So if you do a literature search and you type in human factors in Medline, for example, you'll find very few references to human factors at all in the 1980s or in, until the 1980s and early 1990s. And even then, they're quite low in number. And then James Reason, who uh, some of you will know from the, the, the Swiss cheese model fame, he, uh, he wrote a paper that was in the BMJ on understanding adverse events. Now it starts to get the more interest starts to start, starts to come about human factors within healthcare. Then we have the big report in 2000, in the US just to air it, to air is human report that had a lot of human factor stuff in that. We have GABA, who's a Stanford anesthetist, who was also a, a private pilot. And he became interested in the kind of the team aspect of human factors or the crew resource management training. He designed training for this crisis resource management, which started the move, I think, from aviation, perhaps into at least into anesthetics and then to other specialties of, of healthcare from then on. And then in the late 2000s and even now, it's there's there's more human factors uh, regulation around how you design medical devices. And there's been some recent uh, FDA and some recent um, European legislation around the needs or the, the recommendation that we need to have a new medical device. It needs to be considered from a human factors perspective and from an end user perspective. So this is Paul O'Connor's myths about human factors. So I've been working in human factors for 25 years, let's say, and I've been working in human factors in healthcare only since 2012. So maybe that's about 11 years. So when I started working in human factors in healthcare, at least in Ireland, I think there was a, my perception is of the perception of what people thought human factors was, were, was that worked in healthcare, was it was something to do with communicating with patients. So it was all to do with, the, and that was what human factors was, and that's what people understood it to be. Then I think uh, you got some pilots in to do kind of grand rounds and, so, and to do some presentations. So then you get the pilots in, and then the percent and the pilots talk about team teamwork and team performance, and maybe that that helps to move human factors into something to being about improving teamwork and improving communication. Then I think it moves on a bit from then, and now it's it's about teamwork, but it's also about fixing fixing error and reducing error, and it's all of these things. And like I, I showed you earlier, it's also more than more than that. And reducing error is not just about reducing error by 
focusing on the person that's doing the work at the, at the sharp end, as it were, on the, uh, on the shop floor, but it's looking back throughout the organization and looking at how, how design of equipment or the design of teams or how we work contributed to that error. And I think maybe now we're in the kind of era of human factors is something that can be done. Human factors is a thing that you do, which isn't entirely true either. It's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of understanding how teams work, how organizations work, how equipment's designed. It's more a way of thinking about something to allow you to then consider how, how we, can, we can make improvements using taking a human factors approach that is more than that's looking all throughout the entire uh, socio-technical system that is, that is healthcare. So next slide. So it is about safety, but it's also about more than safety. And it is about adverse events and how to proactively improve safety and mitigate issues. But it's more than that. It's also about quality. It's also about su supporting improvements in quality of care, work practices, workforce satisfaction, which is also important and relevant. And it's also about efficiency. So certainly when I was in the US Navy, they weren't so easy, so interested about safety when I talked to the senior people, but they were interested when you talk about money savings and you talk about quality and you talk about efficiency. So it's all of these things. So human factors definitely has, is, has safety implications. And that's kind of why I started this way, but it's much bigger than that. It has quality and it has efficiency um, implications too. So in terms of how we work and making the workplace itself better for patients, but also for the people that work within the system as well. So next slide. So I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Angela and she's gonna take you a little bit through the, the guide itself and how we've organized this. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Um, thanks for talking us through and thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about our guide with you. Um, so what we, the purpose of this guide was to provide an overview of human factors and how it can be applied in the healthcare setting. And there was three main points that we wanted to make in, in, in within this guide. One was that uh, we'd like to support healthcare workers to identify the human factors issues in their workplace. So really to provide some knowledge for human factors to understand the breadth and the scope of human factors within their own domain. And so they, to help them to understand what the human factors are, issues are in the domains that they work in. So that's um, aim number one. Aim number two was to support the identification of human factors contributors to incidents. So rather than just looking at a narrow focus uh, and narrow contributors to adverse events in healthcare, we really believe that it's important that healthcare workers have this broad understanding of the human factors contributors to incidents. So moving away from that person at the sharp end, moving towards an understanding of how the system as a whole usually is implicated in these adverse events and understanding all of the different aspects within the system that contribute to adverse events. So that was aim number two. And aim number three was to provide examples of interventions that kind of have a human factors focus or uh, have a human factors theme and how those interventions have worked in human fa uh, within the healthcare domain and just a little understanding of human factors as applied to the healthcare uh, system. So that's what we hope to achieve from the guide. Thank you. And so the format of the guide then, it draws upon, we try to draw upon the seminal human factors research and literature and practices. And we've tried to present that in, a, in an accessible and a user-friendly format. Uh, we've tried to use as many real world examples as we could. And we try to outline the practical implications of using some of these human factors techniques and principles uh, and methods. And uh, we've tried to write as many links to online resources and to an additional reading. So really, we didn't want to make this guide really big and really long and overwhelming and too much to read. So it's just a very, very kind of a brief look into the key topics that we think are, are the key topics and with much more detail in the readings. If, if you're into what, whatever you're interested in, you can delve into in a bit more detail in the readings that we've provided. And we've, we've tried to limit that to the really interesting readings, the seminal readings and the seminal resources that might be helpful. Okay, so the guide is structured using the socio-technical systems model. So what is a socio-technical system? Well, it's simply a system in which people and technology um, or systems interact. And so uh, this uh, socio-technical model of healthcare was um, 
devised initially by Maury in, in 2000. And the World Health Organization um, used this model. And we think it's a really useful model uh, to support the understanding of what are the human factors that are involved in the healthcare system. So uh, this model shows the patient as central to, um, yeah, thanks. This model shows the patient as central within a layered system of care. So we recognize that the patient has their own, each patient has their own um, values, attitudes, preferences, beliefs, wishes, needs, wants, culture, language, all of these things that affect the care that the patient receives. And we, um, in, in chapter two of, of the book, we talk about patient-centered care and how important patient-centered care is and how the patient can cont contribute to uh, patient safety and quality of care. So surrounding the patient, then you have the work environment and the equipment that um, you know come into contact with the patient. So these are things like the space that the patient has and that the staff have to work within, the resources that they have, the equipment, the machinery, how well those things are maintained, um, how well they work, how many there is, if there's enough, and can you get access to them, even things like beds and resources. So all of those things will impact the care that the patient receives. And these are all human factors that impact patient care. Then working with the patient, and I'm still on that previous slide, working with the patient, we have individuals. And we know that individuals bring their own knowledge, skills, attitudes, competencies, and they bring all that to bear on the work that they do with the patient. Individuals work within teams. Um, teamwork is crucially important to patient safety. We know that, and to patient care. Uh, we know for teams to function effect effectively and efficiently, they must be cohesive and coordinated. And we know that that's so important for cont continuity of care for the patient. So this involves good interdisciplinary and interprofessional communication, good team process, good team culture, and good leadership. Then surrounding the teams that work in the hospital, you have the organization and management structures. So um, what we mean by this is the organization, its structures, its processes, the priorities that the organization has, the values that the organization is working under, the culture of the organization. And ideally, you know, in high functioning organizations, all of these things are designed to support the core work of the organization. They're designed to support the work. Ideally, they don't interfere or impinge or hinder the work, the core work that needs to be done. And we also recognize that society, regulatory environment um, also has a huge impact on how the hospitals and the healthcare system itself works, that these all impact the resources that are available to our healthcare system, the values of the healthcare system and the priorities that are focused on. So this model is crucial, I think, to understanding, and these are all the factors that we are interested in within human factors, within the, the domain of human factors. And so we designed our uh, guide around these factors, because this pretty much incorporates most of what we wanted to talk about in terms of knowledge around what those factors are and what they mean. So if we move on to the next slide, you'll see that I'm not going to go into this in, in a lot of detail now, but you'll see that we've structured our guide around um, that Mori model. So chapter two discusses the patient as the service user and all of the issues around understanding the patient, patient-centered care, that kind of thing. Chapter three looks into issues around the work environment and equipment. Um, and that's a really interesting factor that uh, chapter for people that don't know much about this. This is Paul's area of expertise. And uh, this is really interesting about the design of equipment and, and that kind of thing, which is really interesting, I think, for people. In chapters four and five, we talk about individual level um, factors. So uh, the cognitive skills, sometimes they're, they're called non-technical skills of situation awareness and decision making are discussed in chapter four. And we look at kind of the um, personal resource skills of stress and fatigue in chapter five. And then we move on to the team level. So we talk about team communication in chapter six and teamwork and leadership in chapter seven. Again, we touch on those issues. You could write an entire book on communication within healthcare and books have been written and we've referenced them. Um, so this is just a touch point on what are the key issues here. Chapter eight looks at organization and management issues and chapter nine, the impact of society, culture and regulatory influences on healthcare. Um, so that's the first part. So part one of the book looks at the foundations of human factors in healthcare. Knowledge tries to provide that knowledge base 
but what are the factors and what are they all about and what do we need to know to really understand those factors? So that's part one. And then in part two, we pull it forward a little bit um, in the next slide, please. So then in part two, we try to apply that knowledge um, to the application of human factors in healthcare. So in chapter 10, uh, we look at the application of human factors to incident review. So what we're trying to do is to support a really systems level approach to incident review or incident um, uh, um, awareness of what are the causes of incidences within healthcare. So we start off that with a description or a discussion around the Swiss cheese model. And I think the Swiss cheese model is really important because it really focuses our attention in on a couple of issues. One is kind of a systems um, perspective as opposed to a person centered perspective that we had going back um, years before. So the Swiss cheese model really focuses in on taking a systems perspective and also looking at those active and latent failures that can lie behind most um, adverse events that happen in healthcare. And we move on then to the discussion of the Yorkshire Contributory Factors Framework, which is really, really important, which is used by the HSE and which is a really great overarching model for helping us to understand the causes of adverse events in healthcare. And in, you know, we wanted to draw your attention to safety one and safety two approaches. Um, and really what we mean by safety two is really trying to use, we can use um, those models and those um, principles to understand what goes well in healthcare as well as what goes wrong. Because more things, far more things go well, um, far more things are successful than are unsuccessful. And we must learn um, really from how resilient healthcare is and how, the, as Paul says, you know, people are the crucial thing and people are what keep healthcare safe. So understanding what they do on a daily basis um, is what we mean when we're talking about safety too, as opposed, as opposed to safety one, which is about um, looking back on what has gone wrong. So that's what we try and focus on in chapter 10. And then in chapter 10 and 11, what we try and do is give an example of human factors interventions that have been successful and that have been used. And we have selected one intervention for every level of that model. So an intervention that involves the patient, an intervention that involves individuals, team, uh, teamwork, the organization and uh, society and, and regulation. So we have provided examples of interventions at each level of the model. Um, and we introduced the IHI model for improvement because in the, that's kind of where we're going now in terms of small changes that can be made in healthcare. They're very much based on the IHI model for improvement. So we think it's important for people to understand what that model is all about, what it means and how it can be applied within healthcare in smaller units. Um, so, um, if we just moved on to the next slide, so I just overall, I just want to make the point that um, a human factors approach within healthcare involves developing a thorough understanding of the problem space. So, uh, really, before we can begin to do human factors, um, what we really need to, uh, what I'd really like to stress today is the importance of really um, starting any type of a project or approach with that, with really trying to develop a really thorough understanding of the problem space. So human factors practitioners use a wide range of theories and measures and approaches and techniques in order to understand the problem space. And these are not, you know, uh, really mysterious techniques. These are just things like talking to people, um, trying to understand the processes and systems and, uh, that they use, try, trying to understand all of the aspects of the healthcare system that they touch upon when they're doing their work, understanding where the blocks are, understanding where the barriers are, understanding where there is friction. And um, so there, there are simple techniques and approaches. Some of them uh, require some understanding to use, but most in the, for the most part, we use techniques that are accessible to people and um, in understanding the problem space. So then the important thing is that the appropriate strategy and approach will depend on the problem and its context. What is the problem? What do we need to understand here before we start designing solutions? And really the idea is that solutions then are tailored to meet the needs of the situation and the context. So solutions not only have a safety implication usually, but so solutions very often have a quality and efficiency implication as well, because we find that safety, quality and efficiency goals are interconnected within healthcare. You can't have one without the other. They're all the same. If, if a system is, um, dysfunctional, it doesn't work well, it's cumbersome, it creates loads of workarounds, well, then that's not going to be a safe system. 
So safety, quality and efficiency goals always go hand in hand. Um, and, and we believe that it's really important and we know that it's important that healthcare workers are invested in the process and are involved in the process because healthcare workers are the ones that understand the processes. They understand what can and should and needs to be done, how things can be done. They understand the intricacies of the healthcare system that we on the outside don't. But I think the, the real uh, beauty is to marry up people that are uh, knowledgeable and experienced in human factors and the application of it to um, workplaces and those people on the inside that really understand how the system works and what's required um, and get those two groups to work together to understand the problems and to design solutions that will tackle those problems. I'm not sure what the next slide is. So uh, that's mainly what we wanted to say there, unless Paul wanted to come in and say something else before I uh, acknowledge the- No, no, I have nothing else to say. No, go ahead. No, we're good. Okay. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge all of the people that supported us and helped us and read drafts and uh, reviewed all of the things that we came up with. And they really helped um, to really refine this and really make it usable and, uh, you know, approach uh, um, applicable to workers on the ground. So um, all of those people listed there, I won't name them all out, read multiple, multiple drafts and gave us lots of feedback and really worked with us on fine tuning this document. So we're very grateful to, for their input and their support. So thank you very much. So that's all from me and Paul. So I'm gonna hand over now to uh, John Fitzsimons. Thanks, John. Well, thank you, Angela, and uh, and thank you uh, so much, Paul. And I'd like to um, to echo uh, Lorraine uh, in welcoming the uh, the guide coming to us all, and um, and to really uh, echo again uh, her congratulations to you both. I think on a, on a really fine piece of work. I think um, it, it is a a comprehensive but extremely accessible. Uh, uh, guide, and I think it's 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 really nice to see something you know so useful and usable you know coming here. And I think so often we I suppose benefit from international publications, so it's nice for us to to have something here that will be available, obviously within the Irish Health Services, but I think will also be of of, of interest to people uh, uh, around the world. And and I hope to see it um, uh, uh, you know taken up with interest, and we'll certainly be sharing it with our friends and colleagues internationally. Um, thanks, Paul, for that walk through kind of the the, the, the background and purpose of human factors, and um, and, and I, I like the myths as well. And um, and thanks, Angela, for the uh, the kind of review of, of the guide and and um, the foundations and the applications of it. And and uh, like I said, I think it, it'll be a really great piece of work. I, I think it, it's it, it's fair to say you're both experts uh, in this field, but. Did you learn anything writing the guides? Was, was there anything surprising when you when you went to to put it into uh, into this format into something that would be used by by uh, healthcare staff in Ireland? I think it's hard to keep it small. I'm not sure. I think maybe when you guys commissioned the guides, you thought that we could kind of give ten top tips to human factors and everybody <laughs> does them and everything's okay. But that now it's a hundred pages long. It's we can't give. T it's like asking you know ten top tips for cardiology, you know, it's so big that you can't, it's very difficult to give 10 top tips because I don't have them. Yeah. So maybe that's kind of the challenge. And I, I'm slightly worried that people are going to look at it and think, oh my God, this is hideous. This is a hundred pages of human factors. And I, maybe it's like the Bible. I don't think you have to read it like, you know, page one to page to page 100. I think you can, um, you can pick and choose the bits that you want. So we've done our best, spent a lot of time, like trying to make it accessible uh, the other problem is it has to speak to all of healthcare that we found that very challenging to do. So this has to be relevant to an anesthetist and also re relevant to a community care nurse. And I think in reality, what would happen is the guide kind of needs to be taken and then t by people who are expert in that, in that domain and then tailored to their needs. So, uh, for example, when, when you deliver a human fact, when, when human factors training is delivered to pilots around the non-technical skills, it's not delivered by psychologists like myself. Psychologists like me talk to the people who are giving the training, who are pilots, who then take that and adapt that to the kind of pilots they're doing, be they fighter pilots, helicopter pilots, or, you know, Aer Lingus pilots. It's delivered by pilots. That was the real, the real challenge was attempting to kind of get this down to something that 
you know, and you want to, I mean, Andrew had a lot of arguments about what, what should go in, but also what should go out. So that, that was the hard bit. You, you guys will be the judge of whether we've achieved it or not, I guess. Yeah, I think you've got a really nice balance there. And, I, you know, and that's an inconvenient truth, isn't it? I mean, human factors is complex and there's a lot of things to, uh, to take into account. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, it has been difficult really to, to see it integrated into healthcare. Yeah, so I think this is the kind of the start, at least here now is maybe that this is a starting, here's the starter document, I guess, and then you can go from there, but it does, everyone needs to tailor this to their own domain. And I mean, even the, even if you take anesthetics, you know, the ICU in Sligo is not the same as the ICU in the matter. So even within that one domain, it has to be tailored, a bit like QI, it has to be tailored to the specific domain that you're looking at. So it, it is definitely, unfortunately, I'm sorry, there's not a one size fits all solution to this. I wish I wish I could give it to you. But, um, it doesn't exist. And An Angela, how would you recommend kind of starting to use the guide? I mean, is, is it a cover to cover read or, you know, would you start by reading kind of the, the, the introduction and then maybe look at a few chapters? How, how, how would you recommend, uh, you know, starting to access it? Um, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, to start with some chapter that you're interested in, if you feel like teamwork is an issue that you're interested in or, or leadership or decision making, you feel like there's some issues around that within your, your domain, you might be able to um, dip into one of those chapters just to, to whet your interest and maybe read a little bit more. Um, yeah, the idea was that in those first few chapters is to really to scope out the, the domain itself. And then in the in the second two chapters, the second part of the guide to see how we can apply that knowledge. Because I really feel a basic understanding and a basic knowledge um, comes first before you can you can apply it. Because I do really feel sometimes that those myths are stifling um, some progress in the field. Because you know we do still hear a lot of people that say communication. That's human factors. You know communication, um, and whether it's communication with colleagues or communication with patients. Um, you know, or teamwork, that's human factors. And I think there is this kind of limited view of what it is. And Paul and I had some very robust conversations about this guide and where it, what the focus of it should be. And Paul really felt it needed a very broad focus that covered the whole of the domain. I think where my starting point was to really focus in on kind of safety, understanding safety issues and kind of, you know, really, you know, getting into that Swiss cheese model in detail and the Yorkshire contributory factors framework. But Paul really felt strongly that it should have a bigger and a broader focus. And I reluctantly, you know, agreed with him in the end that really getting it right at the start, getting the, the scope of human factors right now is better. It's a better idea um, because I think really understanding what the scope of it um, from the outset will help people to figure out where we need to go from here. Yeah. You know, and I, I very much take the point that that you know that there is a depth to 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 the science of human factors, and 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 that needs to be appreciated. But do you think you know a little bit can can be helpful? And you know, if if you were to look at the chapter on on leadership or situation awareness, do you think you know there there will be lessons that can be applied after reading that chapter? I, I believe there are. I yeah. believe there are too. I definitely believe there are. I think an understanding of some of these things, an understanding of some of the pitfalls that we fall prey to, an understanding of some, you know, some of the theories and principles, an understanding of what we actually do without realizing that we're doing it. You know, a lot of this is just putting um, a language around the things that you know healthcare workers already know that they do. They just don't have the language around it, for sure. And for yeah, and I think I think I think you'd both agree that that you've probably seen in your own practice over the years. You've probably seen many good examples or heard of many. Great examples of, of human factors being applied in, in the Irish health services. Yeah, I mean, you can, it's like taking a safety to approach. There's lots of people out there doing a really good job every single day. Unfortunately, you don't get that feedback, which I know from all the healthcare people I work with, where you only hear about when things go wrong or when things go badly. We're not, but there's lots to be learned from the things that are going really well all the time. And we don't, we don't. We don't think about that. Maybe we, you could take the Yorkshire contributory factors framework and I could apply that to uh, to a challenging case that went much better than expected. And all the same learning could come from that as came from something that went terribly wrong. But actually the thing going going right, maybe there's more value in that yeah. because um, we can learn from that rather than this really weird thing that happens that maybe 
but maybe it's not really that relevant. It's the, it's the learning from what goes right. And it's taking the time to do that. I guess you're forced because you have to investigate when things go wrong. I don't know how we make the time to investigate when things go right. Cause there's so much that can come to come from that. I'm getting, I'm trying to get away from the focus on the bad. Now I really want to focus on in my research. I want to focus on the things that go well. We talk about kind of, kind of positive deviance even. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, human factors and your guide, I think again, gives us some of the language that helps us to, to pull that out and, and, and really to be able to communicate then, you know, what, what is it, what does good look like and, and how do we do it? Um, Lorraine, um, how would you like to see the guide being used? Um, well, I suppose I think this is a very good foundation. And like Angela says, it's there to whet everyone's appetite. And I know that within the guide, you quoted the World Health Organization that it's every healthcare worker needs to have a knowledge of the principles of human factors. So that's absolutely key. So hopefully it will be used widely. Um, and thank you to Stephanie for including the link of where we have it actually published on our incident management um, page within the HSE. Um, so it's about raising general awareness and I, I see the dialogue already. Actually, people are sharing more resources and um, more kind of uh, pieces of information on how to tap into human factors. Um, I think there's more work that we can do, of course, um, and I'm happy to learn that my colleague who leads on education is looking at, you know, how can we build more human factors training into the system? Um, while I know there's obviously some great work underway as well, but um, generally as a discussion point, and I think my bias would probably be in incident management and, you know, moving away from that person focus. So it really, you know, it is so complex as you highlighted now. So managers or people who are doing incident reviews, really applying some of the learning from this human factors guide when they're analyzing and kind of making recommendations um, so that we look at the system learning rather than the individual. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got we've got lots of questions coming in there and I, I'm gonna maybe just, just uh, bring a few of them up. Um, uh, Paul or Angela, feel feel free to to, to answer kind of uh, as as you feel. Uh, 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 first one here, kind of difference between perception of near misses in in healthcare versus other industries, and maybe other industries where maybe human factors is more established. Do you think? Do you think um, where where there's a more deeper human factors approach that that near misses have greater usefulness or meaning? Anybody want to comment on that one? I've studied near misses in lots of different industries to include healthcare. I think people perceive them in the same way, the same way they understand them. They kind of understand where, where they come from. I think part, part of the problem when I've studied near misses with certainly with healthcare workers, I did, uh, did some research with interns. They did a lot of, uh, kind of the blame is on them. So you found that the interns tended to think that this was their big mistake and this thing ha went wrong because of them. And actually when you pick apart from their explanation of what went wrong. When you pick it apart, you can see it's not just them. There's a whole team looking after them. There's a whole organization. And it's like, they don't, they don't see that. So I think maybe, maybe in healthcare, there's more of a, of a tendency for people to blame themselves mm. for, for errors. than there might be in other industries where there's kind of a greater understanding of the environment and the context in which they're working. So I'm always telling all doctors and all nurses I speak to, you really got to consider the context. I'm not saying you, you don't acknowledge that you made an error and try and understand that, but you also have to be aware of the context that it occurred yeah. in. Uh, because I think sometimes people are too hard on themselves or these interns were too hard on themselves. And there was a whole context around why they made that error where they weren't supported properly and they were put in an error provoking situation. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think I think there's a kindness in in human yeah. factors that you know I think it's an awful thing to 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 especially early in someone's career to suggest that that uh, they're solely responsible for something you know that that that's clearly a system uh, uh, problem. Um, another question there, just uh, safe and ultra safe. You know, is is it can healthcare be safe and ultra? You know, can can it be ultra safe? I mean, I, I think we know there is examples of it there, but. Is 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 healthcare inherently riskier and and more varied and more complex? You know that that it makes the idea of ever being you know ultra safe is 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 really just not possible. Um, I can ask this for Angela. I think that um, I think maybe healthcare could be safer than it is. I think sometimes people kind of hide behind it a little bit, where they say, okay, this is a risk. I think sometimes. 
I don't think we can all get to ultra safe and some of the ways of managing an ultra safe system might not work say for those ones at the other end like emergency ICU. But I think it's worth thinking about and there are aspects of, of healthcare that are ultra safe like yeah. radiotherapy or blood transfusion. People rarely get the wrong bloods. That's the equivalent presumably of uh, landing with your, with your wheels up. It doesn't happen. There is a risk that if everything, but that scales back to the context and think about it. If we try and manage everything, you couldn't run I see an emergency ICU in the same way as your blood transfusion service, it would it wouldn't work. Yeah. So we can aspire to be ultra safe, but I think you do there's some care has to be taken that you're actually stifling people's ability to do their work. And you all know all the time in healthcare, you hear about people kind of working around the procedures. They don't feel the procedures are helping them. And so if we try and run everything like an ultra safe, that that's the risk, I think, is you're giving you're removing the flexibility and actually Yeah. And that flexibility is, is critical, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Within I, reason. I just I add one thing. I feel we can learn a lot from ultra safe, ultra safe organisations, but we need to know where those parallels break down in healthcare. Yeah. Right? So we can't apply everything. We can't learn everything. There's certain certain things that healthcare is uniquely different. Like there is no patient in other industries. You know, if a plane or a piece of equipment is faulty or broken or doesn't work or isn't well, we don't fly it or operate it. You know, we put it out of service. We can't do that with our patients. You know, we have to operate, we, you know, we have to work with them even when they're not fit, you know? So yeah, there's certain, certain nursing lessons we can't apply and loads of others, but yeah, we can definitely learn from them. We can definitely learn from the culture that they have in other organizations and culture is huge. We know culture eats strategy for breakfast, as they say, the culture in those organizations is something that we can really learn from and how they tackle risk within their organizations. And that's, that there's a question there about how do we how do we embed it in practice and how do we cascade how do we push it out into the system how do we how do we bring that culture about yeah yeah i don't think yeah. that is make everybody read that human factors guide for example i think that would not put people off i mean there's maybe certain people in the organization that might want to read it but then they need to take it and apply it so some of the if you're some of the training maybe some of your procedural writing people. I think it's it's just like, this isn't something that everybody needs. I know we've called that Human Factors Guide for Healthcare Workers, but perhaps not everybody needs needs to read that. So I think to cascade it is you guys need to think about contextualizing it in where you work and how you work. Neither myself nor Angela work in healthcare. So uh, we're, we're, and we're giving you the theory, but the application has to come from the healthcare workers themselves. We, you know, you guys have to decide what you want to do, how how you want to do it. I think the days of you know people coming in saying this is how, you, this is all you need to do. Every you need to do this, but I don't work there, so who am I to tell you how to work? There needs to be some like they've done in aviation with the psychologists and the pilots. Maybe you need to say, and that's the good because me and both me and Angela work in medical schools, so you, it's quite good because I can tell my colleagues that I work with and say this, you should do this, and they say that's a bunch of crap. You don't know what you're talking about. This is what it's really like working at the front. So your 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 ideas aren't going to work. And then we need to go back. So it's this marriage between everybody where everybody, you know, we have an we have an opinion, but you guys are the one that have to kind of do this in the real world. And maybe uh, maybe what we're suggesting isn't isn't practical or feasible based on the resources you have and based based upon the way you work. Great. Well look uh, again all I can do is 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 congratulate you both on a on a very fine piece of work. It's really nice to see it there. I, I'm so proud that you know the HSE has commissioned this, and and like I said, we're usually the recipients of of, of documents kind of um, that are published internationally. And I really I really hope to see this one been picked up um, because I think it, it'll stand up to anything, uh, and uh, I think it'll be useful throughout the world. So well done. And uh, there are some I think links there to the the whole guide. If anybody hasn't got it, I think we'll be putting those links up on Twitter as well. Um, in terms of trying to uh, uh, get it out there, please please share it and um, tell your friends about it and tweet and 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 let everybody be aware of it. And and, and you know I don't think it's a bad thing. I think I think uh, uh, everybody should be certainly encouraged to have a look at it, be know where it is, and uh, and I certainly encourage people to. To, to to read the uh, the the the, the, the uh, opening bits and then find something that interests them in it. So well done. Um, just a, a slide there. Just the Q Ireland network map. So uh, please, you know, uh, visit uh, the 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 website and 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 uh, look at the uh, the the map and and join up there. 
um, and and again, really encouraging people to join uh, to join Q and uh, put your connections up there. And and really, our whole goal here is to get an, a network of improvers across the country, and uh, we'd love you to be part of that. Um, next slide there. Um, so yeah, again, uh, please look up uh, Q um, uh, and and apply to become a member. Uh, Caroline uh, Lennon Nally, our colleague in the HSE, is also available. Her email is there if people are interested in joining. Um, next slide. So yeah, just really to 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 give you the heads up for our next and our final webinar of the year uh, with our colleagues uh, Emma Hogan and Jennifer Martin. Uh, and that'll be on using uh, um, COVID to understand measurement for improvement. Some really, really interesting work that they've been doing there. Again, that's been picked up internationally. Uh, so uh, for, for people who are interested in COVID or in measurement or in improvement, uh, that's a, a date for your diary. So uh, once more, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Lorraine for launching the guide today. Thank you so much. And uh, a big thanks to Angela and to Paul on a really excellent piece of work. And we look forward to seeing you the next time you will get a a, a short uh, questionnaire uh, pop up as you sign off please give us your feedback because it helps us to make the um uh, the webinars better and look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple of weeks time bye bye thank you thank you bye